Okay, hello. Um, as I just hello again, as I just said, um, I'm Guido Günther, and um, this talk is about libvirt, which is um, a library which um, aims to make virtualization a little bit easier, especially um, with the sheer amount of virtualization solutions we have in Debian. Fortunately, in Debian, we can pick off about any virtualization solution that's available on the Linux, like QMU, KVM, Zen, VirtualBox, Linux containers, OpenVZ, or user mode Linux. And um, this is actually a very nice thing. But the problem with this is um, some of these virtualization solutions um, either don't have a stable ABI to work against, or they kind of tend to change the command line syntax um, from release to release. And um, well, at least in my case, it's if, if I have to use more than one or two virtualization solutions, I always um, forget how to add a new disk, how to add a new device to the virtual machine, because it's all different between these um, solutions. And so um, the bird aims to abstract these common pieces of the virtualization solutions and provide an ABI to be able to use always the same um, ABI and command line interface to do, do these kind of things. Um, so. Just, just as I just said, um, so we are aiming for a stable command line interface to manage virtual machines, and we are also aiming for a stable configuration file format, and we are aiming um, for a stable API, so the um, programs we write don't break with every new um, version of a virtualization solution. Um, the format is XML-based, which is not everybody's favorite, um, and obviously not all the features supported by all hypervisors are available in libvirt. This has two reasons. One reason is that um, the hypervisors supported don't have a don't have a different feature set. So um, one hypervisor might might support um, net device hot plugging, another probably not. And um, even if both support net device hot plugging, it might not be the the driver in libvirt might not implement um, this at this point in time. So um, it's so you won't have you have a, a stable a, API, but you won't have all the features maybe available in a certain version of, of libvirt. But the features certainly will only increase over time. Um, so um, when you use libvirt as a virtualization API, you have a command line interface um, that that uses li this library. It's called virg, and it simply offers all the commands you would expect to have for a virtual machine lifecycle, like. You can list all the available virtual machines on a host. You can get the domain information, which is kind of um, how much RAM it currently uses, and these things. You can get a description of the XML format currently used. You can define new domains. You can edit a domain, which um, simply you can just say virtual edit, and then the name of the virtual machine, which will spawn your editor, and you can edit in it, and then say save, and the um, configuration is adjusted. You can start new domains. You can destroy them, and you can, of course, shut them down. Then there's save, restore, suspend, resume, migrate, what you probably would expect. And on top of that, there's also some statistics functions. So you can get some block device statistics, or you can get some domain, some interface statistics for network devices. And you've got um, all the necessary command line things to attach and detach um, new disks, new network devices, or um, to pass in like USB devices from the host to the virtual machine, or PCI devices, for example. Um, Another area which libvirt covers and which also Virch, the command line tool covers is, um, is, is an, our tools to manage um, disk images. So you can, um, libvirt tries to um, organize disk images in storage pools. And these pools, in the simplest case, this is just a directory. Um, you can just list them, get information about it, um, can again get the XML definition and so on and so forth. And if you look at this, this basically maps most of the, the um, command line arguments map the, map the things in, in the Avast, so, um, which makes it pretty consistent. Same goes for um, networking. Libvirt has, a, at the moment, quite simple um, interface to define networks for virtual machines. And again, you have some set of commands in Virch that um, lets you modify them. And again, they look pretty much the same than the ones above. Um, last but not least, you have some um, support for um, enumerating host devices, like you can list the PCI devices or the USB devices in the host, so you can easily get, get the necessary XML descriptions to attach them to a virtual machine. Um, the whole point about this is that this, all these commands come in blocks, like 
different um, because they um, operate on different um, aspects of virtualization. And in these blocks, they're usually prefixed with something like net or pool or node dev in this case. And but they're all pretty consistent between these areas. Um, so once you've used Virsh on the command line, and um, I just picked some of the commands you're, you'll be using to start and stop virtual machines, um, it's actually quite easy to get started with, a, with using the C library itself, because um, again, the C library maps pretty much to the command line interface. So if you want to list all domains, you have in the C library, you have an interface which is just called connect list domains, which um, lists you all the um, running domains. You have a function um, corresponding to the info above, which is called ver domain get info to get the domain information. You have a function in the C library to get the XML description, which is dump XML from above from the command line interface. You have a function um, to define new virtual machines via XML, which is called in the C library domain define XML, and it's just called um, define above. You have um, a function to start a domain, which is in libvirt, unfortunately called virt domain create because it's start in the command line interface, but destroy and shut down just map directly to the C API. So um, the, the whole point here is that once you just know your way around on the command line, you basically know how to program libvirt. Um, um, the other nice thing actually, I think is um, libvirt itself is written in C and um, but you have bindings for lots of languages. So you have Python bindings, you have Perl bindings, you have Objective Camel bindings, and you have Ruby bindings. All of these are already available in Debian. There are also Java bindings, but um, they are not yet packaged because um, I'm not that much interested in Java, but if anybody has interest in, it, in this, we can do this too. Um, I want to show a very short example of, on how to actually access um, Libvirt's ABI. Um, I've picked Python because it's just a little bit more dense than the C code, but the function calls actually map quite well to each other. Um, of course, as in Python, you import the libvirt module, and then um, the first thing you do is you open a connection to, um, to libvirt in order to tell it what kind of hypervisor you want to use. So in this case, we want to use QMU, um, which um, as, as, as hypervisor, and we want to use a system QMU, which means we want to use a QMU that runs as root. and um, is spawned by a daemon that is called libverti. We'll see what that actually is just in a couple of minutes. And um, then we get back, back a connection object, and then we can just, as in the C API we saw just before, we can list the domains and um, get back the domain IDs of the running domains, and then we can um, look up each domain by its ID and get back a domain object, and we can just call the name attribute and we get the names of all the running virtual machines. So it's actually quite simple. One other nice thing in libvirt, which actually isn't in the command line interface because it just makes no sense there is, um, libvirt has an event-driven um, call. You can just say, I've got a program that is interested when my virtual machine crashes because I want to send a mail to root or something like that. And um, that's actually quite simple too because you just say you want to um, domain event register um, a callback, in this case, it's simply called domain event callback, and you can just pass on some additional data if you want to, but we don't in this case. And then you just define your callback, which um, just has a connection object, a domain object, event information, a detail of the, of the happening event, and the data we probably passed in below. So um, this makes it actually quite easy to not only to start and stop virtual machines, and you don't have to check if this is actually running, because Libvirt will actually tell you if the machine crashed or if somebody saved the domain. Or something. Um, there's a small library called libvirt-glib, which just makes this even simpler to plug it into the glib loops, or if you're writing a GTK-based program, it's probably not real, real from the back, it's gtk.main. Here it's ending the GTK main loop. Um, the nice thing is you just have one additional call, and it's part of your glib main loop, and um, you just can use the GTK-based program. So in order to show this a little bit, I've just written a very, very short um, program, which I just call VM applet, and it's actually quite stupid because um, it just doesn't anything more than, than the slide I just showed before. It just listens for domain events. So um, yes, I sure. So but it's actually, yeah. Does that help? I can, I can increase it even further. So. 
just sorting virtual domain and with a, the VM applet, which is just sitting in my system tray here, got a notification and it just shows that the domain has been started. So it's actually quite simple. Um, so I can save the domain to a file. I have to tell it what the file should, should be called. And I again get a domain event and interesting are the domain details because it tells me that the domain has been saved. So it tells me the domain has been stopped and it has been saved to a file. And um, I can restore the virtual domain, um, something like this, and it says again the um, domain has been started and the virtual machine has been restored. So in, in contrast to the, the virtual mach machine has just been booted. So that's actually quite nice and quite simple um, interface. Um, the point about all this is basically the Python program is actually a little bit longer than what is on this slide, but there's no other libert related call in it. So um, the rest is just the GTK stuff for getting it in the trailer and all this. Um, so how does this all look from the above? Um, the application like VM applet or, or Versh, the command line interface, um, just links against libert obviously and then um, uses the API of libert which is here and libert itself called, has a list of drivers for all the different virtualization solutions and in almost every case um, it just goes to the remote driver and then uses the um, URL we provided just in the beginning and this tells um, in this case of QMU to call into Liberty. Liberty is the daemon I've just mentioned which runs on the system. Liberty itself calls into Liberty again and uses the QMU driver to manage all these virtual machines. It also it would be pretty much the same if we say um, we wanted to create a new virtual machine image. This would be pretty much the same. The application would call, it would use the libert API, it would use the remote driver, it would call into libert and it would then not use the QMU driver but the storage driver and create a new virtual machine disk image. Um, the, the big advantage of having something like this is that. Um, you can very, very easily do all the um, virtual machine management on remote systems too by just changing this um, your URI and um, just making sure there's some kind of transport available to the remote system. So um, what kind of URIs would we expect in these cases so that we already had QMU um, system, which means we are using a libert daemon that runs with root privileges and um, so it's able to do pretty much everything on the systems. The, another URI for QMU and KVM is session, which means um, there will be a libert daemon started with permissions of the U, with a um, UID of the user. Um, this will automatically be started if you use session, and um, so you don't have it running as root. In the case of Linux containers, the um, URI would just be l lxc the colon slash slash slash, and in the case of Xen, it would be Xen. Um, when you in in the case you, for example, when you call into Liberty, how are the permissions managed? It's um, quite simple. There's, there's a socket on, um, in var run for the system Liberty, and whoever has um, read-write permissions to this socket has permissions to add, modify, delete virtual machines. So it, it, he has full access to the system, and um, access to this socket on Debian is um, handled via a, a POSIX group, which is just Libert. And if you're a member of this group, you have full access, and if you're not a member of this group, you don't. Um, so since this is pretty powerful, and you might have users that should only be able to, for example, get a VNC connection to the virtual machine, so they don't have any management capabilities, just only can um, get a graphical display, there's also read-only access, um, handled with another socket, which is var run libvirt libvirt socket minus read-only at the end. And um, on Debian, per, um, by default, every user has access to this socket, so everybody is, pro is basically able to get um, a VNC display. Um, for desktop systems, you can also um, edit the Liberty configuration and use policy kit for all that, so you don't have to use any groups. Um, just the person using the X session will be able to access the socket, and, just some, and then you can define by policy kit the, the rest of the permissions. So as I already mentioned, the the advantage of having such a daemon is that you can very easily handle um, remote access. So by just as a kind of a transport just behind the QMU in, or behind the Xen in this case, you can um, just access remote hosts that also have virtual machines and um, there are several transports available. One of the simplest ones is SSH. In this case, um, it will just do SSH into the remote machine and call netcat on the socket above, on the var run libvirt socket. 
And um, TCP means we are really connecting to the remote um, Libvirt daemon via TCP. This has some advantages because we can use um, SASL authentication like um, Kerberos and we can use um, SSL client certificates if you want to. Um, as an additional thing, Word Manager, which is an um, application that um, is responsible, well, we'll see that later, but um, this is the graphical user interface for managing virtual machines. Um, can also um, tunnel the VNC session over SSH so you can get the display of the, the machine on the remote host. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Okay, um, the system daemon is just started via an init script and runs with root privileges. And the session daemon um, runs as your user and runs with your user ID. So. Okay, so the, um, the system daemon, in order to be able to talk to it, I have to have access to these sockets, right? Right. And the session daemon, um, I can use that to manage my own um, yes. KVMs under my, my own. Exactly. And so you, don't, you, you use another socket, which is in your home gear and home directory, and you automatic, automatically have access to that socket because it's created with your user. And um, the, well, quite often you can actually use the session thing, but um, if you want to create a network devices or something like that, you, you need privileges you don't have as a normal user. So if anybody has another question, just interrupt me and um, we can just do that in between. So I now want to give a short overview on the tools we, we have available that already use Libvirt in Debian. And um, there are several of them already, and one of them is, is the, the Virt inst group of programs. One of them is Virt install, which you can just use to install new virtual machines. Um, it's Virt clone if you want to clone an existing virtual machine. There's, then there's Virt manager, which is the graphical user interface. Um, there's Virt viewer, which basically is a very is, a, is a, um, only there to access the VNC machine, but you don't have to figure out the port where the VNC display is. But you just give it the name of the virtual machine, and it will do the rest by itself. Virttop is a top-like tool. It's just instead of showing processes, it shows um, virtual machine CPU time and memory usage. Um, and we have a set of um, plugins for Moonin, so you can quite easily monitor your um, virtual machines using Moonin and the whole. Sorry. Sure. Pretty soon, but it's good. I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. Thanks. Um. So the, the whole point about these Moonin plugins is that you don't have to do any configuration. You just tell it which kind of hypervisor you want to use, and it will pick up all the virtual machines running and start do, drawing some graphs about memory usage and block device statistics and network interface statistics and these things. Um, there's also the guestfs, which is not virtual machine related, but more related to the images of virtual machines. Um, this is a library that um, allows you to very easily manipulate images of virtual machines. So if you have a image of a virtual machine which uses LVM and which uses maybe some encryption or something like that, it's quite hard because you have to do a loop mount and you have to all activate the volume groups in that thing and um, libguestfs tries to figure out most of this by itself so you can um, limit, uh, so you can edit virtual machine images without being root on the machine. This, there will be more about that later. Um, so let's look at virt install first. Um, virt install is as I already said, it's the tool to set up new virtual machines, and um, since we're supporting different hypervisor solutions, um, we always have to tell it which hypervisor we actually want to use, and in this case, it's again QMU. We are, we're again using the um, process that has root privileges, so we're using system and not session, and um, the virtual machine should be called Lenny, and it should have 256 megabytes of RAM, and um, we're telling Virtinsol that the OS type is Linux, and the OS variant is Debian Lenny. Um, what would this be useful for? Actually, um, Virtinsol tries to figure out um, 
and tries to be as smart as possible when it comes to speeding up virtual machines. So if you, for example, if, if your guest supports virt.io, it wants to enable it just from the in installation point of view, and um, Debian Lenny su supports virt.io in, in Debian installer, and Debian Edge doesn't, and so if you tell it Debian Lenny, it will use virt.io, and if you tell it Debian Edge, it will just pick what was available in Lenny. In the case of QMU, this would just be IDE. Um, the nice thing about, so this is the OS, OS type of the guest, I should add. It's not the host, it's the guest. This it might be pretty obvious for um, anybody here when it comes to Debian. For me, it, it, it's very helpful if I wanted to do, like, say, Windows virtualization because I don't know which version of Windows supports ACPI or APIC and um, which version of OpenSUSE supports virt.io. And by just specifying the right OS type and the OS variant, virt install will just figure it out by itself and do the right thing. Um, of course, you can override that on the command line. We should see that on a minute. In a minute. Um, so import means we don't want to um, create a new disk image. We already have one, and um, the new image we have is um, a disk with, um, which sits in a, in, in a storage pool with, with a name default and um, with a name lenny.image. Um, the networking we want to use is QMU's user mode networking, and the model inside the guest should be virt.io, so we say model equals virt.io. Um, that's actually a pretty simple example. We can do something more elaborate um, with some more command line arguments. The beginning is pretty much the same. We're saying virt install. I'm just reading this because I think it's quite hard to figure out in the back. So um, we again use minus minus connect to connect to, to QMU. Um, we use minus minus force to stop any um, prompting for and any user interaction. We again use as name Lenny. We use the same amount of RAM. And um, this time we want to have a new disk, so we say we want a new image in the pool default, and it should have the size 10 gigabytes, and for caching we want write back caching. Um, so, and we want to have a second disk, and this one is already available, so we can specify the volume name, which I will just explain in a second what that is exactly, and it's again in the pool default, and um, the volume name will be with USB Lenny preseed.image, and we want to have it attached to the bus, to the USB bus of the virtual machine. Um, again, we want to do user node networking with a virt.io model, and ad additionally, we pass the location argument, which um, is a URL, which is ftpde debian.org slash debian slash dis slash stable slash main slash installer e386. And um, we pass some extra command line arguments to the kernel, which are not, well, which are basically passed to Debian installer then. And um, the nice thing is then that if you just use this kind of um, installation, it will fetch the, um, the netboot images from Debian, and um, in this case from Stable, so from Debian Lenny, download them, um, and start Debian installer with the arguments that are just there on the command line. So this is pretty much convenient for um, Debian installer testing, especially if you had another volume, like in the above example, which um, adds a USB device um, with preceding, so you can um, do fully automated Debian installer testing. I have another question. Um, how does it know that it should call the installer? Um, no, well, it's actually, it's, um, it downloads the, the, the kernel and the init RAMFS and passes it onto KVM. Okay, so, so location is, a, is an argument that gives an, a URL directory, and you expect, or virt install inspects to find in that directory a kernel and an init yes, RAMFS. Yes, actually, yes, and, and the location ar argument actually is um, in a way that it figures out this is a Debian distribution, so... Um, the kernel and the init RAMFS are called like this or like that, and if you use another kind of location argument which points, for example, to a Fedora server, it will do the right thing for a Fedora system. So um, this is actually quite nice, I think. Um, so we've just had the word storage pool sometimes um, in this talk, so I wanted to explain a little bit more what that is. Um, storage pool is actually something pretty simple. It just keeps virtual machine images. And there are several types of storage pools. The simplest thing is, well, I should add, you can do everything without storage pools. It's just convenient to use them. Um, the simplest thing is a directory. So the, it's a, a directory-based storage pool. It's just a directory in the file system. Um, slightly more complex is a file system. No, I'm, that's a spelling error. Um, 
a file system based storage pool is actually like a directory pool, but it's backed by a block device. So you have to give it a block device and, and the mount point, and when you activate this kind of storage pool, it will take the block device mounted to that location, and from there on, it will basically look like a directory based storage pool. You can use disk based storage pools, which are partitions. You can use LVM storage pools, which are volume groups, and um, you can use iSCSI based storage pools too. Um, each pool has a target, and the target is, like I actually said, a directory or a volume group, and some of the, them have a source, e.g. a block device. So in the case, case of the file system-based storage pool, the source would be the block device, and the target would be the directory. Um, the, I forgot to explain the network-based storage pool. This is basically not a block device, but an NFS export. So it's not much of a difference. Storage pools contain volumes. In, um, in the case of directory-based or file system-based storage pools, th these are just files. Um, in the case of LVM-based storage pools, these are the logic volumes. In the case of disk-based storage pools, these are partitions. And like in the case of iSCSI storage pools, these are just the block devices from the other end of the um, iSCSI server. Um, in, you can do something a little bit more elaborate, so you can use a, a backing store in these kind of storage pools. So you just get a base image, which is probably a Lenny installation you want to have, and then you can just put an overlay onto that, um, and all, right ex all, all modifications to that image will just go onto that overlay, and the thing behind that overlay is just called backing store. And um, so you can just install Lenny once and to have several virtual machines which all use the, the same backing store. This depends on the image format used in the pool, and QCOW2 just supports this um, out of the box, and this is why it works. So this is, all of this is not something Libvirt implements, but it always leaves to the tools provided by the, by the hypervisor or the virtual machine. Um, Vert Manager is just the graphical tool to manage virtual machines. It's kind of the verge for the, for the X-Window system, so um, you can do pretty much everything with it, what you can also do on the command line, so you can, um, so you can just start some virtual machines, remove um, and add devices, um, have a graphical display or display of the serial console of the virtual machine, you can display statistics about um, disk and block devices, you can see this in the image here, I don't know if you can read it from the back, and um, you can manage port storage pools and volumes and you can manage um, network stuff. So. It's just the graphical representation probably, I think it's quite useful and especially since you can um, just add several um, hypervisors. So in this case, we were using the local QMU, which is a system QMU in this case, and down there there's another um, connection to a machine called PowerBook, um, which, is, which is using Zen, and um, there's another machine which is using QMU and we have some um, two, two times QMU in this image because we're um, connecting um, with one connection to the system QMU um, and with another connection to the um, session QMU. Okay, another tool in this list is just for clone, which is just very simple to clone a virtual machine. So you have one and you want to have another one that looks exactly like this one. And what you do is um, you again pass on a connection URI. So, um, so the bird knows which kind of hypervisor you want to use, and then you say what is the old name of your virtual machine, and you pass in the new name, and then um, bird clone just asks you, well, how shall I name the new disk image, and then you just tell it, and it will just copy the machine, and you're done. So you get a new XML definition and all the stuff necessary to start the new virtual machine. So I already mentioned bird top. It's just a top-like tool. It, it's, you can see it in the image. It's just... Um, display processes, but it displays virtual machines. So it um, sorts them by CPU usage by default, but you can also use sort them by memory usage and see which virtual machines are actually running and which of them are turned off. This is a nice example because it doesn't use the Python bindings as all the rest, but it uses the objective camel bindings. Um, so quite new in this, this libvirt universe is um, libguestfs. Um, which is a library to, which is not that much related to virtual machines itself, but to the images um, that, that virtual machines use, the disk images. And there's a shell tool that is called guestfish, and um, there's again lots of, lots of, lots of language bindings. It's, um, there's libguestfs Perl, which is the Perl bindings, obviously, and Python libguestfs, which are the Python bindings. Um, there are also bindings for Haskell, Java, Ruby, and Objective Camel, but the package we, already, we have at the moment doesn't build them at this time. Um, so there's kind of so there's kind of 
predefined recipes to do certain things with libgizfs find at the URL http libgizfs.org recipes.html. And um, there are other tools coming with libgizfs like worddf, wordcat, and wordinspector. Worddf is um, just a tool which you just pass it the name of a virtual machine and it will just look at all the disk images um, of the virtual machine and see how much free space there is and um, just tell you without, uh, that's, what, that's actually the important point, without starting the virtual machine. And um, WordCat is um, a tool which just gets you a file from, from any of the disk images and WordInspector just tries to analyze the, um, the disk images and it tells you the kernel version in that, in that virtual machine images, the modules loaded and these kind of things. Um, I just added a short example how to use um, guestfish on the command line. Um, in this case, we are not using an already existent um, disk image, but we are creating a new one, so we're telling guestfish, um, please allocate, just by using alloc, any preset image for megabyte, please allocate the four megabyte um, sparse file then, and this is probably the most important point. So um, in order to look at, at, um, at guest images of virtual machines easily without starting the virtual machine, what is the trick to do this? Well, you start another virtual machine, which is a very small appliance that is shipped with libguestfs itself, which is using QMU and um, which is using VM channels to talk to the then booted virtual machine. So you boot uh, this small appliance and the small, the small appliance just um, uses um, the necessary commands like, v, um, like PV display and all these things to figure out the details about the virtual machine disk images. In this case, it's, um, we run the appliance and tell the appliance to create um, a partition table on, on def HDA and then we tell it to add a partition to def HDA, then we tell it to make a, um, um, a VFAT file system and um, mount that file system, then we copy a pre-seed CFG and unmount it, quit and are done. And when we're done with this, and if we think back to the, word, to the second Word install example, there was um, a USB disk which was passed into the virtual machine for the Debian installer testing. And so you can basically pretty much automatically create these kind of disk images by using this. And the only thing you have to provide is a preceding configuration. So this is, again, very useful for testing Debian installer with different preceding configurations. Um, Yes, some notes about debugging libvirty problems because, or debugging libvirt problems in general, there might be problems with some kind of things because some, maybe some hypervisor doesn't implement a certain feature or something is just broken, so there are log files in var log libvirt. And if you, for example, this is um, a good example to, if you're using, for example, QMU in the system mode, there will be in var log libvirt. If you're using it in session mode, they will be in your home directory in dot libvirt. Um, Word Manager um, has a no fork option which puts all its diagnostic outputs onto standard output, which is quite helpful and also writes a log file in .wordmanager.log. Um, there are also log files for the Word install tools in .wordinst. And if nothing else helps, there are some environment variables you can, you can use. So there's something like libvirt underscore debug equals one, which you can use in front of anything that links against libvirt, for example, libvirt itself or maybe in front of Versh or um, in front of Word Manager. And to the libguestfs tools, the environment variable is libguestfs debug. That's about the um, tools we have. So everybody who's still not really convinced to use um, libvirt instead of do doing all the stuff by hand, there's even in libvirt, there's some kind of API which helps you to to migrate your existing domain configuration. So I, again, I, because I use this most frequently, um, pick the example of QMU and um, the DOM XML from native call, which is also available from the Versh command line tool. You pass it in a um, QMU command line and it will output you the XML that is needed to um, start a QMU with this parameters. Um, there is also a wiki page which has some more info on how to switch from QMU to using libvirt. Um, basically, you're not switching away from QMU, you're just putting libvirt as a layer over QMU, of course. Um, so what is missing in libvirt? Um, what I think what is missing is we don't have a nice API for doing snapshots. So you can just snapshot machines and just discard them or go back in time and all these kinds of things which are actually supported in different hypervisors, but um, Libvirt just offers no API for it. 
and um, there's no fine-grained user management. Every, either you can do everything with the virtual machine or almost nothing, like you only get information to access to a VNC display or display virtual machine configurations. So there's no possibility to have a user that is not able to create new virtual machines but is able to add new disk images or something like that. Um, Fedora actually has some kind of nice SE Linux integration, and um, Debian doesn't have this at the moment. That would be nice to have. Um, what will come in the next versions of Libert? Um, there's another kind of library on the horizon which is called NetCF, and NetCF tries to abstract the um, interface configuration. So because every Linux distribution tries to do it in a different way, some of them um, use if up down, and some of them use another um, way to do it. And so in order to not interfere with all these native mechanisms of Linux distributions, some guys decided to look to write a library which is called NetCF, which allows you to, um, to do network configuration in a way the distribution wants it, and this will allow Libvirt to do much more complex network configuration than it can at the moment. And there will be multipath support in one of the coming versions. There will be support for new hypervisors for VMware ESX, if anybody cares and um, for open, open Neb Nebula, which is actually quite interesting because this is just an interface into your Open Nebula cloud. And for QMU KVM, there were some features mit missing like net device hot plugging, and um, this will be added, and there will be some enhanced security using C groups in the next version. And um, well, the Packaging Libvirt group has a mailing list, which is called PKG Libvirt Discuss. Um, everybody is very welcome to join it and to discuss issues related to Libvirt. Libvirt. Um, and there's the wiki page in the Debian wiki, which is wiki Debian org teams Debian Libre team. So that's it. Sure. Um, another question from me. Um, you said when you were mentioning the QCOW images, yeah. you said you would have like one Lenny install and then you would just track the differences in mm -hmm. a QCOW image for other ones. Why would you want to do that? Well, maybe because you just. You have. I've been using this. Um, well, I can give an example that I used. I um, I, I, I'm always short on disk space on my laptop, so I just made a um, default Lenny install, and then I wanted to do some clustering tests. So I had basically an image which had all the packages installed, and I have two virtual uh, two two nodes in the in, in my virtual cluster, and they're almost the same. They only differ in the host name. So I just use um, one gigabyte of space instead of two. So it's just but, for saving space. But these are uh, throwaway hosts. You don't keep them because you can't upgrade. Well, you, you can actually. How so are you going to do an upgrade from Lenny to Squeeze? No, no, OK. Then I will throw them away. This is just for testing, sure. OK. Um, what's the status of in Lenny? Is it production ready for servers? Well, we've been using it, but it's lacking quite some features. So there are backports available on backports.org, which I think they're production ready for servers, and I'd be interested to know if they aren't. The, the backports are production ready rather than the packages currently in Lenny. Yes. I'll, I'll give you my example. I'm currently running a Zen DOM zero that's still on edge. Um, okay. The hardware is KVM capable. Okay. Um, it looks like I could upgrade to Lenny and migrate everything to KVM okay. given the Zen issues. Yeah. This looks like the right way to do it. The machines in the data center, I don't have easy access. Okay. Is this expected to work if I'm careful? <laughs> yes, I, I think so. Well, well actually, I'm using it production on. Um, I'm using it in a production system um, on Lenny, but not with um, with KVM, but with Zen. And I've done lots of things with um, Libvirt and KVM, but not. Product, uh, not, not, in the, not with a version that is actually in Lenny, but with a version that is on backports.org. Well, actually, I'm using uh, LibWord with KVM on with, well, with real Lenny packages, which mostly works. There are a few things that don't work, which are more related to KVM. So I'm having a funny time trying to, uh, to hand over USB devices uh, uh, while inserting them and pulling them out again which the KVM version can't do currently in Lenny, and the other version has some other interesting f features, which also doesn't really make it f easy to hand over uh, USB devices to some in embedded Windows 2008 server. Okay. But yeah, that's very special other, yeah. other than that. 
with Linux uh, guests and uh, it really works very well with the Lenny version. So yeah, yes. and in the end, so it's, well, this is kind of hair splitting, but um, well, in this case, the Brut works, but KVM doesn't. So you w would have to use a KVM backport, not a Brut backport in your case, well, right? It, so it even, it even the KVMs work. Yeah. If you just do the standard Linux things, yeah. like you forward network devices yeah. only on boot time, you forward only hard disks, that all works very well for me. It just stops the working when you want to dynamically forward USB sticks when they are entered into the computer and revert yeah. them if you say are pulled out again. But that's not the no standard use case in the data center. Well, there was something missing in, in Libroot for quite some time, and this, this was actually if you're running KVM instances and you restarted Libroot, you would lose all your Libroot, your KVM machines. And this was actually, we fixed this quite a while ago, but I'm not sure if this is in Lenny. I would just have it's, to look it up. It's not yeah, okay, so, but I think this is in the back ports, actually, but it's not in, it's not in Lenny. Hi, uh, I have a question. What happens if the libvrd daemon is restarted or simply crashes? Um, in the current versions, n nothing should happen. So you just restart it and it will pick up all the running KVM instances and should be fine. Uh, so, so this has been fixed. Is this in Lenny? No, it's not in. Uh, no, it's, okay. it's not in Lenny, but it's in the back. I, I'm almost sure it's in the backport, and it's definitely in unstable and in squeeze. Okay, and another question uh, for um, GuestFS: Why are you not simply using KPartix on KPartix on the base system? Well, because you actually you could, but you have to be root. That's that's one thing, and especially if you want to do loop mounting and all these kind of things, and. Um, it's kind of, well, that's, that's about it. So you can just, LibGetFS yeah, tries to sense. just abstract some things out of it. And if, you, if, if you're just very familiar with all these different Linux commands, you need to um, use kpartix on the system, then activate all the volume Sorry, groups. Sorry, no, I meant, why doesn't libvirt or guestfs use simply kpartix instead of booting a new VM? No, but your root okay, argument yes. makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, do you do you know whether it's plans supporting Levert for Linux AV server? Or any plans on it? No, I, I don't think at the moment. So, but it's actually, it's just the matter of somebody writing a driver. So and, it, sorry? And do you know whether it's uh, uh, difficult or not to, to write a driver for it? I'd say it's not that difficult, because actually the, the, the guys who do most of the Libvirt work at Red Hat, they, most of the time they even merge partial drivers, so they're um, merging drivers which um, only are a, um, capable of dumping the XML format, but not creating new virtual machines, so you rely on your old tools to create new machines, but you're, so you can just go step by step at networking afterwards and these and that. It's Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs>